I just want to welcome all of you for coming out to Live Fit, Live Well Summer Lecture Series. Super excited to present to you once again. If you are joining us for the first time in the lecture series, I invite you to come back to the additional series. And if you look on your table, you should have a list of what talks are given when. And of course, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. Central Market has provided the food for us, and we're so grateful for that. And the city of Southlake has provided the childcare next door, and we're so grateful for that, as well as the space here at the beautiful Mark. We're fortunate in Southlake to have this wonderful building and hope that we can always be taking advantage of it the way we are today. Southlake Style is a local magazine. You're probably familiar with it. There are copies out for you. Feel free to take them with you. They have been fantastic in supporting our efforts in this. Um, this drive to have a healthier city. Today we're going to talk about simplify and what exactly that means. So when we talk about simplify and I say the words get the penny out of your eye, what does that make you think of? Don't answer. I actually brought some pennies. We're going to do a little exercise. Let me get them out. Miss Skinner, if you don't mind, would you give everyone a penny? If you have glasses, I'll ask that you take your glasses off just for this exercise for a moment. All right, as soon as everyone has a penny, we'll get started. Does everybody have one? And Miss Skinner, if you don't mind, if you'll give me one. If you'll provide me with a penny. <laughs> Thank you. She's our Vanna White for the day. For those of you who have not met Judy Skinner, she's actually the Director of Fitness at Executive Medicine of Texas. She does a fantastic job keeping everybody in check. So I'd like you to take your penny for just a minute and put it out in front of you. Now I know I'll ask a lot of you to take your glasses off, so. <laughs> but just observe your penny. Is it shiny? Is it dull? What year is it from? Just think about it. Where has this penny been? Could you come up with a story for the penny? Now I want you to hold the penny out and just slowly get it closer to you. As you get it closer to you, put it right in front of your eye and close the other eye. Now when you do that and you have it super close, what do you see? That's right, you see nothing. The point of that exercise is we can take the smallest things and complicate them. We can focus in so tightly on the little things, the most insignificant things in our life that we lose sight of all the other things around us. I don't know about you, but I promise you that I can make anything complicated. So let's talk about stress, because when we talk about making things complicated, we talk about what that does to the body. You start stressing out. If you look at the, the gentleman behind me, and you look at all the different things, allergies, accidents, cancer, mental disorders, even if it's depression, anxiety, it doesn't have to be a, a big mental disorder. Maybe a little too much alcohol because you try and deal with that stress. Respiratory congestion, asthma. It goes on and on. Muscle aches, decreased immunity, maybe getting a lot of colds lately. Digestive things, things going on with the tummy. All of these are symptoms of stress. And when we stress our bodies, we actually have our bodies fighting back. For those of you that were at the talk on the gut biome, we talked a lot about the importance of having a healthy gut. Stress can actually make your gut unhealthy. We have a talk coming up after this one about inflammation and what it does to the heart and what it does to the rest of the body. And again, that is a problem that stress can cause. And when you have inflammation, you just Set yourself up for all sorts of other issues. Stress. 
I love this picture because I think I have felt like that. Like I just want to bust out of whatever is stressing me. We're going to talk for a minute about self-induced stress. Anybody guilty? <laughs> Overscheduled? Putting things on yourself? Saying things like, I have nothing to wear. I don't think I look good in this. Being negative, that negative talk, that negative talk in your head will turn everything inside of your body negative. You'll have a physical response to that negative talk. Eating too much and eating the wrong things. I won't go too far into this because we did have a talk on grocery store must-haves where we discussed what food can do to us, especially the processed and packaged foods that cause inflammation, that cause us to be stressed. Women are notorious for this. I can say this because I'm a woman. We often eat our feelings. So if we're stressed, give me chocolate. That's how I am. I don't know about you. But there'll be things that are triggers. And when we have those triggers, we'll want to eat particular foods. And then usually it's the things that aren't good for us. And then it creates a vicious cycle. We're eating, we're stressed, what we ate makes us more stressed, we're eating again. Too much caffeine. Who knows, oh, for a prize, because we love doing prizes, who knows what the absolute worst drink out of the you know, top five is that you can have for caffeine? We're talking different colas. Yeah, oh, everybody knew. <laughs> okay, now we gotta come up with another thing to, to win it. Uh, that's absolutely right, Mountain Dew. So Mountain Dew, has an ex exceedingly high level of caffeine in it. And what happens when we get a lot of caffeine, we get jittery, we get anxious, then you have the crash. So your blood sugar goes up, then you crash down, and you have that, well, you talked about insulin resistance, you have that cycle going on, and it's stressing the body. We often think of stress in the mind, but there's stress in the mind and the body, yes. You mean that caffeine raises your blood sugar, or are you talking about the sugar in the drink? The, the, well, the caffeine raises your stress level, excuse me. And then when your stress level is high, then you also have that increased risk for blood pressure, for diabetes, for cancer. When your stress is high, you're putting your body at risk. Alcohol consumption, big problem. People say, I just need a drink so I can go to sleep. Have you ever thought that or heard that? And people think they sleep better when they have alcohol. But studies have proven that you actually sleep worse. You don't get into the deep REM sleep. You wake up because you, now you've got to urinate. Because every time you have you know, a couple glasses of wine or a couple beers, you have to go to the bathroom. So you don't get that deep sleep. Too busy for yourself. We have a big problem in this country, and I would say around the world, where we actually feel guilty to do something for ourselves. Have you ever not been able to put down your phone or turn it off or even go on a date with your spouse or significant other and you can't stand it if you hear the ding? We're like Pavlov's dogs. You know, we hear the ding and we're salivating. What is it? Who needs me? I'm so important. We all do it. But what it's doing is it's causing us incredible amounts of stress. Also, putting work and other commitments ahead. So this is true for stay-at-home moms. This is true for people who volunteer a lot too much. They get out there, they can't say no, and they're just filling their schedule up all the time. And what that's doing is keeping them so busy that they cannot put themselves on the calendar. And then life events. There are particular things on in life that will cause a stress. You should have before you a, uh, a paper that will list different stressors. I'd like you to take just a minute and look over the paper and mark the things or circle the things. Get your total score for what your stress level is. I think you'll be surprised. If you don't have a paper, raise your hand. Judy Skinner will bring you one. Uh, before we had hospitalists, the doctors were never getting enough sleep because they were waking up during the night, so they didn't get REM sleep. The stress levels are extremely high, and all that goes into those statistics. It's, it's frustrating and it's sad. It's demanding patience. 
the demanding patience. <laughs> All right, so have you, has everybody had a chance to kind of look at it? I'm not going to ask you to read it aloud, but I am going to ask if you're surprised at your stress level. I know I was. When I filled it out, I, things I didn't realize could cause you stress. If you notice, there's some things on there that are negative, but there's also some things in your life that could be positive. But those positive things also raise your stress levels. I'm going to ask Dr. Gammon, I know a few of you are still working, I'm going to ask him to come up with a trivia question. We did bring some journals. Journals are a great way to relieve your stress. So I thought I would impromptu ask him to throw out some trivia. Raise your hand if you have the answer. First one, raise your hand with the correct answer. We'll get a journal. Whose memory is better, men or women? You are correct. <laughs> 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 e even if it wasn't right, you had to say it, right? <laughs> we'll give you a journal here. Enjoy it. <laughs> You're welcome. So work, work, work. How many of us are guilty of this? Yeah, I know, right? Me too. There's some statistics up here which I think are interesting. Those who work more than 50 hours per week average only six hours a night of sleep. I want to challenge you, whether you work outside of the home, you work in the home, or whatever you do, I want to challenge you just for this week to track how many hours you sleep. Just jot it in your phone. Because what you need is at least seven and a half hours of sleep per night, uninterrupted, which means not getting up to let the dog out, not getting up to go to the bathroom, not getting up because you want to eat something out of the fridge. Uninterrupted, seven and a half hours. I bet you're not getting it. And then track it for the week, because if you take 7.5 times seven, that's how many hours you need for the week. It all adds up, all the sleep you miss. They did a lot of research and they found that on average, people were missing over 100 hours of sleep a month. And it sounds like, oh, that couldn't be me. But you know what? I bet it is. You're probably missing more sleep than you can imagine. Working 10 plus hours a day, 60% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. You say, but I only go to the office for eight. Do you check your email when you get home? Do you check your email before you go in? Do you check your email in the middle of the night on commercials? That's work, folks. And that's not letting your brain relax. 2009 study shows a link between long working days and decreased cognitive function. So our brains aren't working. So we're causing ourselves to have dementia because of this ongoing stress, right? And we're wondering, why do we have dementia? We're always on. Think about your computer for a moment and compare it to your brain. If your computer was always on and you never rebooted it, you never closed your pop-ups, you never updated all the updates you need, what's going to happen to your computer? Crash. It's going to crash. It's going to crash and burn. And if you're lucky, you'll be able to fix it. And if you're not, you won't. I think you had your hand up. You have a question? I just, you really struck me with the 10 hours a day and the cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. You said brain not relax. Is there anything more around that study? It's just kind of. Uh, not along that particular study, but there are lots of studies. Uh, all the Ivy Leagues studied sleep. The NIH funded a lot of studies on sleep because they realized as a, as a generation, and the generation that we're now raising, we are not getting the sleep. I do want to touch on something about sleep, and that is we're having things that we didn't have, our parents didn't have to deal with. The, the blue light on our phones and the TVs and the computer screens, that does not allow your body to produce melatonin. Melatonin is what puts you into a deep sleep, what allows you to get that REM sleep that you need. So. I want you to remember one thing tonight about sleep, and that is two hours before you go to bed, do not, do not look at your phone, do not look at your computer, do not look at your TV. And it's gonna be harder than you think. But if you can do this, you will be shocked at how much better you sleep. And also, when you wake up, allow your body to wake up. 
don't get out of bed and go straight to that computer or straight to that phone. We all do it. And just, just avoid it. Get your body woken up the normal way. Get in the shower, brush your teeth, have a routine. When you have those types of routines, your body is actually having a chemical reaction. I just did a medical minute on routines, and there was a, a great study about routines saying that the simple act of getting up and brushing your teeth and having a shower causes a chemical reaction within the body that says it's time to wake up. It wakes up the brain. Everything wakes up slowly. What happens when you get out of bed and you flip on your phone and you go straight to your email? You have just put your body in shock. And when you've put your body in shock, you go on the rest of the day and you didn't get that slow process of waking up that we all need. You, you have to do that so that you don't have the in, immediate cortisol levels that shoot up because you just went from, and we're going to talk about cortisol levels in the next talk on inflammation. Yes, sir. Two questions. <clears throat> One is, uh, is that similar to the jarring of a, of an alarm clock? That, uh, yes. Is, uh, when you were backing up just a, a minute, when you were talking about don't look at your computer two hours prior to going mm -hmm. to does that include, say, tablet where you're reading a book? Yes, except some of the new tablets now do not have blue light. And then a lot of that came because of the studies that they decided we have to come up with a new way to do this because the tablets were actually causing people not to go to sleep. And so the, uh, the newer tablets are made without this blue light. I think you had a question. Uh, I wanted to uh, make a comment uh, on the uh, connection between uh, stress and long hours. It causes the body to release uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline and chemicals like that from the adrenal glands. And what that causes is causes the blood to be more turbulent within your arteries. And that causes more damage to the lining of the arteries and that leads to blockages, that leads to heart attacks and strokes and so on. And in terms of the dementia, the same thing, it will damage the small blood vessels in the brain and they'll get clogged up. So besides Alzheimer's, you can get uh, dementia from cerebrovascular disease, that is the arteries getting all clogged up. And it gets even further, the breakdown products of adrenaline are actually poisonous to the body and they damage the telomeres, which is the part of your DNA that controls cell replication. So all these things are just bad, you know, pure and simple. And that's, that's the physical link between that and something else. In Japan, a lot of the, you know, the Japanese uh, uh, businessmen work six days a week, 12 hours a day for those six days. Then they're forced to go and party afterwards and all the rest of it. And a lot of them die at their desk. They just plop, die at their desk. And it's an official cause of death, worked himself to death. It's the same idea with the stress. And I'm shocked that we don't have that yet as an official cause of death. We should. 90% of all illnesses are linked in some way to stress. And for those of you that may be here for the first time, this is Dr. Gammon. He's from Executive Medicine of Texas. We usually have two people at these talks, one to present and another one to just kind of add comments in and answer your questions. Uh -huh. Um, so when you were talking about the blue light, like my computer screens automatically dim at <laughs> night and then I have that feature on my phone. So is that? Don't look at it. Doesn't matter if it's okay. dimmed. Uh, it like takes a different hue. It, it may take a different hue, but it still your brain is going to sense that, sense that as a wake time. It's going to interrupt your melatonin. And uh, if you have a television in your bedroom, move it. If you have a computer on your, or a phone on your bedside, move it. If you bring your laptop into the bedroom, move it. Your bedroom should not be a place for any of these items. All right. So this takes us to only so much fits. How many of you see yourself like this sometimes and you're like, I can't take any more? I remember my first beeper. I was so excited when it beeped. And then pretty soon I was like, this thing beeps all the time. And it was back in the day when you had to pull over, you had to call the number on a payphone, probably caught something from the payphone. <laughs> but now everything is so instantaneous. We are expected to answer the call immediately, to respond to the text immediately. And what happens in our culture 
is we actually feel guilty if we don't. If our kid texts us and we don't answer them immediately, if we're not at their beck and call, we think we're bad parents. Or our kids go into a, a tailspin. What's wrong? Mom didn't answer, dad didn't answer. I'm freaking out. We're setting them up for anxiety and stress because they're not learning to wait even a second. I like to call all of us the pop-up generation. I don't know how your brains work, but ever since I've gotten really into having to use computers the last 10 years and the internet a lot, I feel like my life is one giant pop-up. Every time I turn around, I'm, oh, I need to do this. Oh, I just thought I should do this. The phone rings, oh, I gotta answer that. The text goes off, ding, here I come, Pavlov's dogs salivating, what is it, who needs me? The kids need me, and it's just like that all day long. And we do that at the office, we do that at work. I have a feature, and when I was actually uh, preparing tonight to talk to you, I was thinking, I'm giving this talk, and I haven't done one of the things that I'm gonna talk about. It's a little embarrassing. But how many of you have Outlook on your computer? Do your emails pop up in the little corner, like when you get them, when you're working on something? You can disable that. I've gotta disable that. Because if you're like me, you're working on something, ding, oh, oh, I need to do that. You minimize what you're working on, you start working on that, and then you start back at what you were on, ding, another one comes up, and you're constantly doing this. Only so much fits in the brain. We can't keep up at this pace. And we have to allow ourselves to say, I can't do 50 things at one time. It's okay. Trust me, if you can get that message to yourself, to your spouse, to your kids, to your parents, you're gonna save somebody's life and the life might be yours. When you were talking about can't do so much at once, I thought there was a study at some point in the past couple of years saying you truly can't multitask. Like, yes, true, right? yes, absolutely. For those of you that may not have heard, she said, wasn't there a study recently that said that you cannot multitask? Yes, there was. And they said multitasking in the workplace actually decreases productivity 30%. Think of a company, a big company, and cutting their earnings, their productivity 30%. What does that do financially? Now, what if, because we're all multitasking, you take that same company and you find ways not to have those employees multitasking, and now everything's up 30%. And they're not working as hard, they're just working smarter. So what do you do when things go wrong? And they will, they will go wrong. If you don't think they'll go wrong, you're wrong. First thing, you have to calm down, you have to put things into perspective. I, I love this, this saying that somebody taught me when I was, I guess I was like 12 years old. And they said, they can't take away your birthday. And you know, when you're 12, your birthday is like the biggest thing to you. And it made me realize that no matter what happened that particular day, they couldn't take away my birthday. You know, you really have to think about those things that you're worried about and decide, hey, are these things really as important in the grand scheme of things in six months from now, in two years from now, in 10 years from now, am I even gonna remember this moment? I bet you won't remember it 10 minutes from then. And I wanna to talk to you about MSU. We write about this in the book, Stay Young, 10 Proven Steps to Ultimate Health. And MSU is make stuff up. I'm gonna give you a scenario, and I bet you're gonna think of a time in your life when you had MSU. So Sally walks into the break room. She hears Mary and she hears Donna talking. As soon as she enters, Mary and Donna go silent. What does Sally think? They're talking about me. They're talking about me. Oh my gosh. So Sally decides she's going to go to the boss and complain. Oh my gosh, drama. So <laughs> drama in the workplace. So Sally goes into the office and the boss slams down the phone and he says, what? And she says, never mind. And she leaves and he calls one of the other two, Donna, into the office and shuts the door. She sees this whole thing happen. Now what does she think? I'm getting fired. 
Oh my gosh, they were talking about me. Now she's in the boss's office. I'm getting fired. My life is over. All this happens in 10 minutes. But what really happened, if she could have just heard the other side of that conversation, Donna had a huge fight with her husband last night. I didn't know where she was going to stay because she was physically afraid. The boss hung up the phone because he just got told that he has to completely redo everything they had done for the last six months. Donna goes into the boss's office because now Donna's got a problem. It had nothing to do with Sally. Yet Sally has just caused herself every symptom on the little silver man you saw and she thinks she's going to die or someone is going to die over the stuff she made up in her head. Now, how do you keep MSU from happening? Next time your husband or your wife is really mad and they're just having a bad day, you have to say, hey, do I know of anything I did to cause this? If the answer is no, you're probably pretty safe. Next time your boss is having a bad day, don't think that the whole place is gonna crumble. Maybe they're just having stress or gas or something like that. Let, <laughs> let them off, you know? Don't get yourself so worked up over the small things. Because you remember that all of these things impact your health so greatly. Now we're gonna talk about exercise for a minute. Lots of research on exercise. There was a, a time when there was, everyone was jazzercising, they were doing aerobics. We were kind of getting ideas that exercise was not going to, to um, harm us the way we used to think. Believe it or not, people used to think that if you exercise, you could die. So we shouldn't exercise. And we realized that exercise actually makes us healthier. It prevents heart disease. We didn't really know why. We didn't understand why. But a lot of the latest research now is based on antidepressants versus exercise. Why? Because our country has a problem with overprescribing antidepressants. And not in one study, not in two studies, in handfuls of studies, they have found time and time again that when they took two groups and they only used exercise in one group, every time, hands down, exercise was either as effective or in lots of these studies, it was more effective than those pills. And just want to touch on those pills for just a minute. I'm not anti-medication because sometimes medication is necessary. I am anti-overprescribing. I am anti go to the doctor and you have a really small thing and they, they have MSU. Oh my gosh, she's crying in my office. She must be depressed. Let me give her pills. And then what happens? We have weight gain. We have the cycle of they can't get off of them. You have all kinds of things happen when we have a country filled with prescription drugs. So let's talk for a minute about stress and hormones. I'm not gonna go too deep into hormones because we have a talk on the list that is all about hormones, but I had to address it. Women, actually in our late 20s, our hormones start changing. People think, oh, you don't go through the change till 40, 45, 50, not true, in your late 20s. Men, usually about 30, you start seeing some changes. And what is happening? Testosterone levels in both men and women are going down. Men that are having too, eating too much junk that aren't getting enough exercise, they're converting their testosterone to estrogen. We refer a lot to that as man boobs. And gynecomastia is actually a sign that they're converting their testosterone into estrogen. And also, they're getting the stress on the body that comes along with that. So, like I said, I won't go too deep into this. We're gonna have a really in-depth hormone talk, but I will say, Hormones play a major role, a major role. So people say, well, how do I know if it's my hormones? Well, which one are you? Because if you're fighting with everybody, your spouse, your kids, you don't like your boss, that girl at work just really makes you mad, chances are it's not everybody else. And the same thing for the guys. I'm gonna to talk to the guys in the room today it's the same problem. When guys' hormones are imbalanced, you will be moody. 
you'll have those thoughts in your head. She can't possibly love me anymore. I don't look the same. I, I've got issues. My memory is not as good as it used to be. Mostly, this is usually a hormone problem and it's easily correctable. So I just wanna to touch on hormones because they are so important. And when we talk about stress, we can't not talk about getting rid of stress if we don't talk about balancing the hormones. So prescription for you. <laughs> Seven servings of fresh fruits and veggies a day. We did a talk on grocery store must-haves and I can't stress enough that you need to be sure that you are getting fresh fruits and veggies. Really important. Um, it, the more processed carbohydrates you have, the more sugar you're taking in, the, the more additives you're taking in, artificial sweeteners, all of these things, they completely, completely flood your body with all the stress hormones. You don't need stress hormones. You need good hormones like serotonin, things that are gonna make you feel good. Exercise helps with that. Uh, schedule me time. Really important that you schedule me time. Because if you don't put yourself on your schedule, somebody else will fill up your schedule. And absolutely, I see some eye rolling like, ooh, I'm guilty. <laughs> absolutely nobody else is to blame for your schedule but you. You do have control of your calendar. It's about priorities. What do you do in me time? What do you do in me time? That is a, that is a great question. I'll throw out some things and if anybody wants to share what they do in their me time, I'm, I'd ha love to have you share with the group. Me time could be once a month on the third Wednesday of the month, I'm gonna go to the spa. But you don't have to spend money. Me time could be every night, I'm gonna take a 30 minute walk in the evening and I'm going to just think. I heard a great, great coach once say, and I didn't think I could actually do it, but she said, sit outside somewhere where no one's gonna to talk to you and actually look at only one thing for five minutes. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I can't do that, my life's a pop-up. I can't look at one thing for five minutes. And I tried it, and just looking at that one thing, you can blink, but not looking away from it, actually let my mind wander. I started thinking all these things I didn't even know I had stored away in my brain. Great ideas, oh, I should do this. This would be fun. And I started thinking of, gosh, I might actually like to develop a new hobby. Or what am I gonna do this summer? Or what would I like to, if I could go to any country, where would I go? That's me time. That is time allowing yourself to get in your head instead of allowing everything and everybody else to get in your head. Does anybody else wanna share some me time that they do? Bubble bath. Bubble bath, great. Back in the day, we called that Calgon take me away. <laughs> but bubble baths are great. I, that's a great example. Anybody else? Judy Skinner? Swimming, oh, I love that. And swimming is a great way to meditate. Uh, if you have a favorite song or you have a favorite poem or maybe a prayer or something, you can go from one end of the pool and back and just recite that and it will put you into a meditative state. Meditation is known to help you live longer. Uh, in, in the book, Stay Young, we actually talked a lot about longevity. We talked about some of the research on longevity and there's reasons that people in certain areas which we call the blue zones there's reasons that they live longer and they have lots of me time they really do and that really helps uh, journal okay speaking of journals there's the word again do you have another medical trivia what is the strongest bone in the body you don't know the exact term you just say where it is the femur is not correct. Your teeth? Not your teeth. Yeah. Skull? No. Although most women think their husbands skull. <laughs> Anybody else? The hammer or the hammer? No. <laughs> oh come on, we gotta give gotta give the journal away. Well, I don't know, like your cat, like the 
bone down? Yeah, we're going to win. That's the tibia. It's the strongest bone in the body. Everyone thinks it's the femur, it's the tibia. Wow. The way to think about it is I'll when you stand tail. up, that bone has to support the entire That's rest why of I was your thinking body. of it logically. I yeah. actually had no idea. There you so. go. <laughs> Very good. You know, see, you don't say, I had no idea. I was just guessing. You say, I knew that. <laughs> see how smart I am. <laughs> All right, so sleep. We talked about sleep. You need to sleep seven to eight hours a night, seven and a half, preferably, should be good. Unless, I mean, some people do require a little more sleep, but seven to eight is a good range. Again, I challenge you to track your sleep and see if you're sleep deprived. On a quick, I'm not going to go in depth on this particular one. Maybe if we continue the series and we go past the summer, we'll do an entire talk on sleep because there's so much to sleep that you just don't know. But if your spouse finds you snoring or if your spouse says you're up during the night, you definitely need to see a doctor because sleep apnea is real and is deadly. People die in their sleep all the time. Athletes die in their sleep all the time. And you don't hear a lot about it, but snoring is the first symptom of sleep apnea. Date night, and the guys are gonna love this, sex in your marriage three times a week. And if you're sitting there saying, what? <laughs> three times a week? That goes back to the hormone talk. So <laughs> if you're not having sex three times a week, you probably should get your hormones checked. But the reason this is in there is because, and we have this in chapter eight of our book, we laugh that chapter eight is the sex chapter, but we try to, whatever we're writing about in health, we do try to make that just kind of an inside joke that all of our books have a, a chapter eight. But this is so important because the hormones that are released within the body actually cause you to sleep better. They actually cause a reduction in your cortisol levels. They relax you. And the sex and longevity are linked, no doubt. So super important there. And date night, I can't stress that enough. And you are not allowed to look at your phone on date night. The phone goes off. And it should be something fun, something new. Shake it up, do a couple of different things. And then laugh, laugh. The average first grader laughs 600 times a day. If you've ever had one, you know. And as we get older, we actually average, if we're lucky, 10 times a day. But when we laugh, we use muscles in our face, we produce hormones in our bodies that actually help us live longer. They actually make us happy. If you're really, really sad, do a nice little Duchesne smile and hold it and you can't stay mad. If you start to laugh, you won't be able to stay mad because there's a chemical reaction in the body that keeps you from that. And I, if you haven't heard the term Duchesne smile, I'll just sidebar for a minute. They, a long time ago, there was a sports team and they looked at the photo of the sports team. I, forgive me, I can't remember which one it was. And it was a, a big team and they noticed that some of the guys were really smiling and Duchesne was the researcher. They were really smiling, and some of the guys just weren't smiling at all. They just couldn't put it together. And they were just somber. They tracked these people, and the ones that were smiling actually lived longer out of this photo. It wasn't a little bit of coincidence. It was a lot of people, and it was across the board something. So they went on, and they, they researched, what does this mean? The smile, how much of a smile do we need? Because if you just go like this, it doesn't count. When your smile actually gets big, I saw one in the back row, and you get the little crow's feet that women say they don't want, those are good things. Because that is exactly what keeps your body in check. That's exactly what releases those hormones within your body. And when you're laughing and you're having a good time and you're smiling really big like this, there's something going on on the inside. Now. I'm going to tell you a little something about forgiveness, a little personal story. I, my best friend I lost a couple of weeks ago who's just shy of her 104th birthday. When I was writing the book, Age to Perfection, which I think we have some of back there, we interviewed people over 100 because we, we started writing this book, Age to Perfection, How to Thrive to 100, Happy, Healthy, and Wise, and we said, 
you know, we're like quoting these studies and we're doing all this stuff. Why don't we actually talk to the people that lived past 100 and say, what's your secret? So we got the top 10 list for these people. And this particular lady, Lucille, she gave me her top 10. I left, she called, and this is how we met several years back. And um, she called and she said, I, I, have to, I have to take one away if I can only have 10. And I have to put one in there. She said, because I can't believe I didn't think of this. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the number one thing she attributed to making it to almost 104. And it was so profound. And as I thought about that, and I thought about people that we've seen in the practice, the people that I knew in my family, people that I knew as friends, people that passed away, you know, when you go to your, your reunions and you think of the people who had passed away, the people who are able to forgive, examine your own life, examine your own friends, you examine yourself. The people who can let these things go live longer. So holding a grudge is just like putting a noose around your own neck. All right, so we talked about what to do, weekly date night, make time, hobbies. If you don't have hobbies, get a hobby. Take screen breaks, real screen breaks. You know, we talk about, we talk about spring break, get away from your computer. Actually put a little message on all your social media, taking a screen break, see you in a week and just don't get on it. You'll be amazed. You didn't really miss that much. And then we talked about sleep, exercise, the journals, make somebody smile every day. And never sit more than 30 consecutive minutes. Sitting is the new smoking. It's been proven time and time again. But sitting is so strongly linked to stress and anxiety. And why do we sit? Because we sit in front of our computers. Now about those pennies. I'm gonna leave you with one story that I don't want you to forget. The pennies in our eyes are exactly what keep us from doing the things that we really wanna do. I had always wanted to go on this trip with my mother, and we planned it all the time. Oh, it's gonna be a riverboat cruise. Oh, we wanna go here. Oh, we wanna do this. And we were adding to the list and adding to the list and adding to the list and adding to the list. And guess what? She had to retire because she has Alzheimer's. No trip. Don't let these pennies get in your eye. Don't put off that date with the spouse. Don't put off that, I wanna go back to school, but, 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 but. I always wanted to do this with my kids, but, 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 but. These things don't matter. What matters are all the bigger picture items. So these little things can stress us out, but don't let them. I want all of you to live a long and healthy life. And if bringing you a little information on stress and how you can avoid it and the things you can do will help you today, then I've done my job. And I'm so glad that you allowed me to stand before you and talk to you about these things. Please take the time to look at your stress schedule, your, your score, and really understand where you are, and then take steps to get away from those high stressors. I have one journal left, so I know you've been sitting there thinking of a great, <laughs> a great medical trivia. While he's thinking, I will tell you, um, Judy Skinner can give them out. Uh, we have little cards. We have a nationally syndicated radio show. And if you haven't downloaded the podcast or listen, listen to it here in Dallas, here in Dallas, we're on Carol D 1080 at 4 uh, p.m. on Sunday. We're on 40 different stations, but it also goes to iTunes the following Wednesday. So uh, Judy will pass out some cards just so you have it. And then there's directions on how you can download the podcast. Or you can just go to the website 
if you don't have iTunes and you can just listen to them. Every day I do a medical minute and then twice a week we do a show, we upload a show um, from the previous um, shows, like the previous week and then we do a best of. So you're always getting lots of great health information. Did you think of your question? What part of the body never stops growing? The, the ears. brain. Ears is correct. Also, <laughs> nose. <laughs> the nose. Yes. <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Do you have any announcements? Okay. I hope to see all of you. I didn't even look at the clock. I hope we're on time. Oh, we have finished a few minutes early. Unless you. Um, you know, have questions, you want to stick around and ask anything of myself or Dr. Gammon, uh, you're free to help yourself to, to some food. We, we really want it to be eaten, so please eat it. <laughs> and then we'll see you at the next talk. The next talk is, I'll tell you, two weeks. two weeks, the 28th. It is on inflammation, and it will either be in this room or the room next door, and it will be given by Dr. Gammon here. So thank you so much.